Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're always thankful for uh, your attendance. We're always thankful that you're here. We're honored that you're here. It's encouraging to uh, see you with us and among us as we try to worship our Lord in spirit and truth. We're thankful for Jeff for those songs, and we're thankful for Roy for that prayer, and always thankful for those individuals that are serving in those ways. You know, there are several different baptisms mentioned in the New Testament, and I was approached a few weeks ago on uh, John's baptism in particular, and uh, just asking about some differences between it and the baptism we see uh, instituted in Acts chapter 2. And uh, I find it interesting when I'm approached with questions from time to time because I find that some questions humble me. (laughs) Because when I was asked that question... Uh, you know, I started to think about it. I was like, I don't, I don't know if I can give an immediate response to that. And I, I, like to, I like to think that when people ask me questions, I have immediate response, like he, here's the answer. And on that question, I did not have an immediate answer. And it's one that, that had me, you know, open up my Bible and say, okay, <laughs> you don't have a good answer, you know, immediately, you know, dig into the scriptures and find that answer. You know, uh, baptism is a, is a topic that is discussed and many times discussed in, in a heated way, unfortunately. Uh, being one of the major topics, I would say, of the Bible, if you were to look up the word baptism, it would be surprising how many times you would find that, particularly in the New Testament. But when we talk about baptism, certainly baptism, the word, if we go just from a literal meaning, does mean immersion. It's hard to get away from that if we dig in and we really look at it. It's really about immersion. Now, with baptism having that meaning, uh, it can be used in a figurative sense. And I don't really want to go down that road of when baptism is used in a figurative sense. But there are some times in Scripture where baptism is used in a figurative sense in terms of this idea of being immersed, being consumed. But what we really want to focus on this morning is we're trying to dial in on the baptism of John and the baptism that we see Pentecost and following. Of course, there are other baptisms that pop up. In fact, when you go to Acts chapter 2, I would suggest to you that there's two baptisms that we see. Is we see the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the baptism comes upon these individuals and they are given this ability where they can speak in tongues and, and miraculous works. And that's important because we actually see the Holy Spirit kind of gets mixed up in this as well when we talk about baptism. Because uh, we have baptism in terms of this idea that we see on Pentecost where these individuals are able to do miracles. But then also we have this idea of the Holy Spirit that we receive as a gift when we're baptized. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we get all these ideas and they all get untangled. And and, and, in some degree we have to try to untangle these to some degree. Some people even argue that the baptism of the New Testament, that one becomes a Christian is actually a baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not actually a baptism in water. It's actually to be saved, you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. What I would say is, is that, once again, I don't want to go into that today, but Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 says there's one baptism. Well, wait, 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 Kyle, you were just saying that there's all these, all these other baptisms. There, there's John's baptism. There, there's the baptism that we see in the New Testament. There's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's a baptism of fire. There's bapti- Wait, 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 it says there's one baptism. Well, the baptism in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 has to be a lasting baptism. A baptism that is going to last until the end of time. And I think it's really the baptism that we see in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19, where he tells everybody to go into the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That baptism is commanded. Uh, That baptism we see is administered by men. When we start thinking about Holy Spirit baptism, it's hard for that to be a commanded baptism because I can't baptize with the Holy Spirit. In fact, we see John make this observation as John says that one's coming after me that can baptize with the Holy Spirit. He said, I don't have that ability. So when we look at Matthew chapter 28, we see that it's, it's commanded. Can a baptism in the Holy Spirit be commanded? Well, it's got to come from God. Uh, I don't know if I can have any role in that. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the baptism that we see going into the New Testament, we see that not only is it uh, commanded, but it's administered by men. And, uh, you know, men, I don't think, can administer necessarily the Holy Spirit in the sense of uh, saving. Now we can get into miracle. But you see the problem is we get all interwoven in this. So we just want to split out two today. We just want to talk about John's baptism and the baptism of the New Testament. 
So let's start with John's baptism. You know, when we look at the Old Testament, the Old Testament is building up. It's building up, it's building up, it's building up. And at, at Malachi, we have 400 years about till John the Baptist comes on the scene. And when we leave off with Malachi, where is the Jewish nation? What is their perception? They are waiting for the kingdom. They are waiting on the Messiah. That's really where, the, where, where Jews are at that state. As, as Malachi ends and, and we have all these prophecies and all these things about the coming, the Jews are in a waiting period just waiting for the kingdom and the Messiah. After 400 years of silence, not really any prophecy, not, I mean, we don't really have anything recorded. This, this period of 400 years, we have John the Baptist pop on the scene. And when we have him come on the scene, he starts saying some things, and I think these are the things that we need to take note of if we're going to understand John's baptism. In Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it says, As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now I tell you, that is not a whole lot in terms of Bible verses, but certainly in just those few verses we get a lot of information. Is John the Baptist is being, it's being said of John the Baptist that he is fulfilling many of these prophecies of the past, that one is going to come and he is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And as we see this, these Bible verses unfold, it says that basically John the Baptist is this one that is going to prepare the way. And what does John come doing? <clears throat> Baptizing and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You know, I find that to be incredibly interesting. I think it's something that our denominational friends look over so quickly and just try to ignore. After 400 years of silence, we have the one coming who's going to prepare the way for Jesus. And what is he preaching? A baptism for the remission of sins. You know what's interesting about baptism is if you look at it in terms of the Bible, repentance is all through the scriptures, but if you try to apply that same standard to baptism, it's like baptism, it comes on the scene when John comes on the scene. The one that is going to prepare the way for Jesus is going to preach baptism. In fact, I think you're going to see really four core messages from John. Is number one, the kingdom's at hand. And we see that in his preaching. He's going to say, the kingdom's at hand, the kingdom's at hand, the kingdom's at hand. What have the Jews been waiting on? They've been waiting on the kingdom. You know what John also says? Is he says, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is going to come. And the other two things is repentance and baptism. Those are really the four core things of John the Baptist, and sometimes I feel like people just lay them out. After 400 years, we have John come on the scene. He is going to prepare the way for Jesus. He's going to make his path smooth. Whenever a king would come, he would have a crew that would go out before him and make sure there was no debris in the way, make sure the path was smooth, and John the Baptist is coming, and he is trying to make it as smooth and as easy as possible for the Messiah Jesus who is coming. And what's his message? The kingdom's here. The kingdom's coming. It's close. It's close. The kingdom's here. The kingdom's at hand. The Messiah is here. The Messiah's at hand. Repent and be baptized. Seems like a pretty simple message, one that I think the religious world somehow misses from time to time. Is sometimes they miss that what is John doing? He's preparing the way for Jesus. He's preparing the way for Jesus, the Messiah. He's preparing the way for the kingdom. He is telling them to repent and be baptized. Do you think that that is going to connect to the baptism that we see in Acts chapter 2? I think it does. In more ways that perhaps we want to realize, at least uh, sometimes our, our friends in the denominational world want to realize. You know, John the Baptist was a very interesting character, and I think sometimes we focus more on his qualities than we do his message. <laughs> look at what he was eating. He was eating locusts. Look, look at what he was wearing. You know, it seems like those are always the things uh, brought up about John the Baptist. But what was he preaching? He was preaching a baptism for the remission of sins. 
In fact, when you look at John, uh, he was very blunt. He was a very, I guess you would say, non, uh, uh, no-nonsense preacher. Uh, in fact, on a few occasions, we see him scolding individuals for their rejection of this baptism that he's preaching, mainly the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He scolds them. He says, bro to vipers. And, and I mean, he goes, he, he goes in there. And then also he has the, uh, the situation with Herod where he tells him he shouldn't be married. He shouldn't be in that relationship that he's in. He said, it's not lawful for you to have her. John the Baptist was very uh, forward. He was very blunt. And he was trying to prepare the way for Jesus. You know, there's some other things that, uh, that we get together, but I would say those are the four core messages of John. He says, the kingdom is at hand. The Messiah is at hand. Repent, be baptized. A simple message. Those four simple things wrapped up in one. And what's interesting is what we say baptism is tied to the kingdom. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus is having a conversation there with Nicodemus. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Wait, what have the Jews been waiting on? They've been waiting on a kingdom. They've been waiting on a Messiah. And what is John the Baptist doing? He says, the kingdom is here. The Messiah is here. Repent and be baptized. Wait, how do we enter the kingdom? John chapter 3 and verse 5 says, lest one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Is John the Baptist getting everyone ready for the church? Is John the Baptist getting everyone ready for the kingdom? He says the kingdom's here, the Messiah's here. What do you need to do? You need to repent and be baptized. And we know that that is going to be the entrance into the kingdom. John the Baptist is getting everything ready. He's doing the best he can. His message is simple. The church is coming. The kingdom's coming. Uh, Messiah is coming. Repent and be baptized. But somehow that's missed in those few verses in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Another thing that's missed on occasion, it looks like that John's baptism was for the forgiveness of sins. Which I think that's why people sometimes struggle with the baptism of the New Testament and John's baptism as we start to look at it. And it's like, man... The baptism of the New Testament and John's baptism, they are pretty close. What are the differences? And certainly we have to try to pick out those differences. But there is a lot of similarities. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2, you kind of see the similar uh, thing. Uh, we see the prophecy. And we see in verse 2, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You get down to verse 6. And we see that he says, And they were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And verse 8. He's talking to the individuals, and we see his, his altercations with uh, the people at the time. And in and, and verse 8, he tells them that they need to have fruit worthy of repentance. Question, if people would have done what John said to do, would they have been better prepared for Jesus? Would they have been better prepared when the kingdom did come, when the kingdom was established completely and fully? Would they be better prepared? I would say they would be. They know the kingdom's coming. They know the Messiah's coming. They know that the message of the New Testament is going to be in relation to repentance and baptism. And that's why I find it so interesting in the denominational world sometimes. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to try to pick. I want to try to help. But you, you look at it, John is the preparer. Whatever John says, we should listen to because he's trying to get everybody ready. And his message was simple. The kingdom is coming, the Messiah is coming, repent and be baptized. And yet somehow baptism has become this weird, strange thing that we can't talk about, that you don't need to do, and, and, and has no relation to God's plan. Then why is John out in the wilderness trying to baptize individuals? Why is he trying to make, why is he doing this? If baptism doesn't have a life after these first few years, then why is John even preaching it? Why is he even bothering with baptism? It seems like a worthless, trivial, trivial, thing, trivial thing if it doesn't have a life beyond John because he's trying to get everything ready. Well, you know, John did all that preaching about baptism, but you know what? When Jesus died on the cross and he raised from the dead and we see the church established in Acts chapter 2, oh, baptism, not important. Really? Now we have to try to do some separating if we can. Like I said, it's kind of interwoven. When you look at John's baptism, John's baptism was done in preparation. John's baptism was associated with repentance. 
John's baptism was associated with the forgiveness of sins. One that I think is overlooked, but I think that's what it's saying in, in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, John came baptizing in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The core of his message would be the kingdom, the Messiah, repentance, and baptism. It's clear that this is the message that John was supposed to preach. But what we cannot forget about John's baptism is where it is at in relationship to the cross and Jesus. And this is probably one of those things that I probably fall short in explaining. But when you look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 17, we get this idea that a testament does not come into effect until the death of the testator. So when you write a will, that will does not come into effect until you die. The New Testament does not come into effect until Jesus dies. So we have this, this period where we have John the Baptist preaching about a baptism uh, in water for the remission of sins. He's preparing the way for Jesus, and Jesus has not died yet. And then Jesus is going to die, and we're going to have the period after. That period right around Jesus and his life and his death is a special time. This transitional period was hard on a lot of people. And you don't have to look too far to find that this transitional period was hard on people. Did everyone accept John and his baptism as he was preparing the way for the New Testament? No. Did people, how did people handle Jesus as Jesus was trying to bring people into the New Testament? This transitional period was hard on a lot of people. It was hard on the Jews. In fact, we can see that in the New Testament, <laughs> do we not? We even see it with Peter, right? We're in the New Testament. Jesus has died. Peter is a New Testament Christian. What is he struggling with? Well, in Galatians chapter 2, Paul has to confront him. Why? Because he won't eat with Gentiles. He, he says, oh, I'm going to eat with the Jews, and, and if Jews are around, I'm going to eat with the Jews, and, but I'm not going to eat with the Gentiles. Well, what did he struggle with? He struggled with this idea from the Old Testament where it was kind of Jew-focused and he kind of got lost in the jew focus, and he wasn't really, he struggled with bringing those Gentiles in. What's another thing that the Jews struggled with as we transition to the New Testament? They struggled with circumcision. In Acts chapter 15, they struggled so much with circumcision because they wanted to pull circumcision from the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a big ordeal in Acts chapter 15 where there's many people going around saying, you have to be circumcised to be saved. The Jews struggle with this transitional period as we go from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And as we go from John's baptism to the baptism of the New Testament, there's a lot of things that are happening. Even think about miracles, right? We have a lot of miracles leading up to the cross, but did the miracles end with the cross? No, the miracles continued until the New Testament was established, until that which is perfect has come. The transitional period was hard. It was hard on Jews. It was hard on Gentiles. It was hard on everyone as they were trying to understand all these new things. And I think we can understand that. If you look at the Jews, everything they practiced, everything they held, everything they learned, a lot of it, was being left behind. Hey, you need to be circumcised. Actually, in the New Testament, you don't have to be circumcised. Hey, everybody's going to be welcome in. Well, we kind of tried to isolate ourselves, and we were kind of just around Jews mainly. You know, bring the Gentiles in, bring in, the, you know. There's a lot of ideas people were struggling with. So what is the difference between John's baptism and the New Testament baptism? You start to look at it, it's like, well, what's the same? Well, they're both in water. I think when you look in Acts chapter 2, the baptism that we see those individuals going through is in water. I think we can prove that from other scriptures. As we see throughout Acts, these people are being baptized in water. We see the Ethiopian eunuch, they both go down into the water. So both of these baptisms involve water. Both of these baptisms involve repentance. Both of these baptisms actually have the phrasing for remission of sins. So we have a baptism over here that's in water. We have a baptism over here that's in water. We have a baptism over here 
that involves repentance. We have a baptism over here that involves repentance. We have a baptism over here that says remission of sins. We have a baptism over here that says remission of sins. What's the difference? This is where I struggled. <laughs> Let me tell you some of the differences that I think I see. Number one, when we're trying to separate these two baptisms out, is one is obviously before the cross and one is after the cross. Okay? People that were being baptized by John's baptism happened before the cross, before Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, right? And then once we get to Acts chapter 2, we have this other baptism, which looks strangely familiar. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Shouldn't they look familiar? John the Baptist is preparing the way for the New Testament. He's preparing the way for Jesus. Shouldn't these baptisms look similar? I don't view it as discouraging at all. I view it as encouraging. Because shouldn't they match up if John is trying to get them ready for what's to come? Okay? But one of the key differences is one is before Jesus and one is after Jesus. One was a preparation baptism and one was a baptism that was immediate. A baptism in preparation and a baptism that was immediate. As soon as these individuals were baptized, what happened? They were added to the church. When these people were baptized, what happened? Well, could they be added to the church? Well, the church wasn't quite there yet, was it? So one baptism was for preparation purposes, and the other baptism was kind of a now, instantaneous. Another key difference, number two difference, is John's baptism did not carry with it the gift of the Holy Spirit. I do not see when John was baptizing these individuals that it was associated with the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you get to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, you see the gift of the Holy Spirit for these individuals. Okay? Okay? The gift of the Holy Spirit, <laughs> which that would get us into a whole nother topic, you know, gift of the Holy Spirit, that discussion. In Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It talks about us being sealed in Ephesians chapter 1, okay? I don't know if we want to totally get into that topic, but the Holy Spirit is connected to this baptism after Jesus' death. I don't see the Holy Spirit connected in that same intimate way as it is after Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit. Before Acts chapter 2, I, I don't see reference to it. John's baptism was not in the name of Jesus Christ. Third difference. Right? When John was baptizing people, he wasn't baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ. They were more referencing, uh, you know, Jesus as the coming Messiah. They weren't really 100%. They were still working some of that stuff out. Even John, we see that when he, when he has interactions with Jesus, he's still trying to make sure that, that he's right and he's on the right track with everything. But this baptism was in the name of Jesus. John's baptism was not in the name of Jesus. The baptism of the New Testament puts one immediately into the body and into the kingdom. Presently. So when it comes to what's the difference between John's baptism and the baptism of the New Testament, I'll tell you, I think it's complicated. But I think there are some things that we can pull out. Number one is this baptism was preparation. This, prepar th this baptism is a now. Okay, the church, the church was here. The church was established. These people, as soon as they're baptized, they're being added to the church. These people, when they're being baptized, can they be added to something that's not quite in existence yet? Number two is that the baptism of the New Testament, we see it connected with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, we see that gift. In Ephesians chapter 1, we see this idea of individuals, when they're baptized, they're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And we could discuss all those ideas and we can get into it. But when we look at it, Holy Spirit... And I don't see the Holy Spirit connected in the same intimate way it is in the New Testament. And number three, John's baptism is uh, not in the name of Jesus. Once we get to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and following, we see that this baptism is in the name of Jesus Christ. And we see that these individuals, as soon as they were baptized, they are put into the body of Christ. They are added to the church. Say, Kyle, I don't, I don't see a whole lot of differences between the two. Or perhaps you say there are big differences because of some of those things that I just listed. John's baptism was to prepare us for this baptism. I don't think there should be a whole lot of differences. 
It sh- should it be radically, radically, radically different than the baptism we see in Acts chapter 2? I'm not saying it's not different. It is different. But to this idea that it's radically different in terms of it seems like people run away from it. John the Baptist said the kingdom is coming. He said the Messiah is coming. Repent and be baptized. And you know what? Jesus was on the same page with all of that. <laughs> he said, I am the Messiah. He said the kingdom is coming as well. And you know what? Jesus is going to end up uh, going with the same message, repent and be baptized. We see a consistency, and that's not a bad thing. And probably the best thing of all is that you really don't have to worry about John's baptism too much. (laughs) Because John's baptism, it does not apply to you and me. Right? Right? John's baptism does not apply to you and me. We are after Jesus' death. We are, uh, we are uh, abiding by Acts chapter 2 and where we see these individuals baptized. We're going through a transitional period, and what John did was important to the church. It was important. But uh, in relation to us, John's baptism doesn't apply to us. We just need to worry about the one baptism in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. That's the one we need to focus on. The baptism for remission of sins, the baptism that is associated with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that's the baptism that we need to be mindful of and aware of. There's so many questions that swirl around. Certainly, if it hasn't popped into your mind yet, eventually it probably would in Acts chapter 19. In Acts chapter 19, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus, and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you not receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have uh, not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to people that they should believe on him who come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Once again, this is, this is a lesson I actually struggle with. It just kind of humbled me because I, I just could not organize my thoughts. You won't see Sarah, but if you ask Sarah, she'd say, I was up for hours just trying to organize. I don't think I organized this lesson well. I did the best I could. But when you get to Acts chapter 19, there's actually two camps. And what I want to say before I go into this, although I think it's important to the lesson, I don't think it matters what camp you fall into. You know why? Because John's baptism does not apply to us. However, there's two camps that come out of Acts chapter 19. And I don't think it matters necessarily which one you're a part of. I think it's good to think about and consider. But this comes in with the question of, did someone who was baptized with John's baptism, did they have to be re-baptized? And that question comes up. And people think about it and consider it. And I tell you that there's two camps that come out of Acts chapter 19. The first camp is, well, you read it, face value, and it's like, okay, well, it looks like these people who have been baptized in John's baptism are being, you know, re-baptized. That's kind of camp number one. (laughs) And that's kind of my summary of camp number one is they read through that and they say, hey, hey, it looks like these individuals were baptized in John's baptism. They had to be re-baptized. Okay, so that's camp number one. Camp number two goes, well, you know, Let's, let's look at this really quickly. When Paul initially asked them the question, he could be asking about miraculous gifts, which is possible, right? Because we we got to split the Holy Spirit up here, not that we want to split it, but there's the Holy Spirit in the sense that you can do miracles, and then there's the Holy Spirit that you have as a Christian. Okay? There's those two. There's the Holy Spirit that gives you the ability to... I'm not saying it's a different Holy Spirit. I'm just saying there's the aspect of the Holy Spirit that you can do miracles. Then there's the aspect of the Holy Spirit that you have when you become a Christian in terms of being sealed. What's Paul asking about when he starts this conversation? Well, a lot of people say he's actually asking about miracles. Because it seems like these people have a belief and he says, Hey, 
Have you, are you guys able to do miracles? And this is not necessarily strange because we see this, don't we? We see this with Simon. Simon becomes a Christian. He's baptized. And then what does he try to do? He says, hey, you guys can do miracles. Let me buy that off of you. And he goes over there and he tries to buy it. Okay? So there is this two aspects of the Holy Spirit. There's the aspect of the Holy Spirit in terms of miracles. And then there's the aspect of the Holy Spirit that we receive when we're baptized and become Christians. So I think Paul realized he's dealing with a complex situation. I think he's asking, basically, uh, he says, hey, can you guys do miracles? And they say, hey, we don't even know about the Holy Spirit. And then he's like, whoa, 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 you don't even know about the Holy Spirit. Then when you were baptized, you know, and he kind of goes down that road. So Camp 1 says, yes, these individuals that were baptized with John baptism had to be baptized again. But then other people look at it and they say, hey, wait a second here. Let's think about this. There's some things to consider. Do we have records of the apostles being baptized? When were the apostles baptized? That's an interesting question. Right? Do we have record of the apostles being baptized? See, people in camp number two, what they say is John's baptism was a preparation baptism but it was a quality and valid baptism that as soon as Christ's church came into effect, these people that were baptized with John's baptism were brought into the kingdom. It was a preparation baptism after all. Now, I'm not saying this whole conversation that we're, we've had for the last five minutes <laughs> doesn't matter because it's, it, it, but John's baptism doesn't apply to you. But this is the discussion that people have. In chapter 19, do we have people that were really legitimately baptized with John's baptism and they're being rebaptized because they have to? Okay? Or are we dealing with a group of individuals that John has died, Jesus has already died and resurrected, these people were basically baptized for the wrong reasons. And they have to be rebaptized for that purpose. But when were the apostles baptized? That's an interesting question to consider. There was a transition that had to take place, and, and I'm not saying I have all the answers on the transition. I don't think it's, a, it's out of the realm of possibility that these individuals that did what John said to do, that were they prepared for the kingdom or not? If they had to be rebaptized, were they really prepared for the kingdom? That's what people say, right? It's like, well, if they had to be rebaptized, then why do they even get baptized in John's baptism in the first place? Okay? It's a transition period. There are a lot of questions that, that I don't necessarily have the answer to, but it's, it's to think about. Now, was John lying to him when he said that the baptism that he was baptizing was for the remission of sins? That's what it says in Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says he came preaching in the wilderness a baptism for the remission of sins. So when people were baptized, was John not really telling them the truth because when they were baptized, they weren't, there was no remission of sins? Or was he just preparing them for the baptism that was going to come associated with remission of sins? But if you read Mark chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, it's interesting the way that that's phrased. The forgiveness for the forgiveness of sins. I'm not saying that I have all the answers to it. And like I said, the discussion that we've kind of had the last few minutes, it doesn't necessarily matter. But when people come to Acts chapter 19, they come away with two ideas. Is number one is that these individuals were baptized with John's baptism and they needed to be baptized with the baptism of the New Testament. That's what they needed to do. That was the problem in Acts chapter 19. Some people go, you know what? That wasn't actually the problem in Acts chapter 19. Is John was already dead. Jesus already resurrected. It didn't seem like these people had necessarily the best knowledge of what was going on. They just needed to be baptized basically the first time because they didn't really understand why they were being baptized in the first place. I'll let you draw your own conclusion on that. But Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, the phrasing is interesting there, and it's usually a phrasing that people bring up. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, it says, then they that received the word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls to them. Now, people will say, Acts chapter 2, you know, these 3,000 people were baptized, and they were added to the church. The Greek word added there is, comes with the idea of something that's already been established. So what people say is that Acts chapter 2, these are the first person people recorded that we see baptized, but it's this idea that these 3,000 souls are being added to something already established. Where you're like, yeah, they have to be, the church has to be there before they can be established, uh, before they can be added to it. 
but you think about the apostles. When were the apostles baptized? I don't necessarily have all the answers. And like I said, you know, sometimes questions humble me because when you start digging into them, you start realizing it's like, wow, I got a lot more to sort out than I think I <laughs> I got a lot to sort out. I got a lot to think about, okay? Your opinion or your thoughts on Acts chapter 19 is not a salvation issue. But I tell you what is, Acts chapter 2. See, we could discuss all day and all night Acts chapter 19, whether the people baptized with John's baptism had to be rebaptized, or that the baptism that they had was fine, it was complete, and it was good. But really what we're talking about is we're talking about that transitional period. And let me tell you a secret. You are not in that transitional period. You are very clearly over here. <laughs> You're very clearly over here. We're not in the transitional period. I don't have to have all the answers on the transitional period. All I have to do is know what I need to do today. So in summary, Kyle, what, what did you think the differences were? I think John's baptism was in preparation. I think the baptism of the New Testament was a now. I think that John's baptism wasn't as closely associated with the Holy Spirit as the baptism that we see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and the baptism of the New Testament in terms of the sealing of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think John's baptism was not in the name of Jesus Christ. I think the baptism of the New Testament was in the name of Jesus Christ. Those are the differences that I can find. And perhaps you can bring some other to my attention. But to be honest with you, when I, when I get done and I step back from John's baptism and I step back from the baptism of the New Testament, I actually find it extremely encouraging. Well, Kyle, why do you find it encouraging? Because when I look at John the preparer, he said there's a kingdom coming. He said there's a Messiah coming. Repent and be baptized. He's preparing the way. When Jesus comes, he says, I am the Messiah. The kingdom is coming. And you know how you get in the kingdom? John chapter 3 and verse 5, you have to be born of water and of the Spirit. And what's the message that we see ring out from Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? Repent and be baptized. I see a lot of consistency there. A lot of consistency that I think, unfortunately, a lot of people run away from. But will you be baptized? Will you run away from that? Certainly we've heard the word. Do we believe it? Will we repent? Will we confess? Will we be baptized for the remission of our sins? Be added to the church. See, we, we don't have to worry about that transitional phase. You're added to the church immediately. Will you do that this morning? Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. If you have any questions or... Or you need or your subject of invitation anyway, we ask you please come as we stand and we sing.